This year's guest urban critic, please welcome to the stage, Maria Vasilaku. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be with you, to be the guest critic this evening. Um, and without further ado, let me take you to Vienna. But let's start first, who's been to Vienna already? Hands up. Yeah, I thought so. Dutch people travel everywhere, right? <laughs> Hopefully not with your cars. Um, well, possibly I can provide some insights this evening that are a tiny bit different from what you already know about Vienna. I would like to share some lessons. I would like to perhaps also try and share some recommendations. Um, and um, this said, let's get started. Now, Vienna is a rapidly growing city. It is actually the second fastest growing city in the German-speaking area. Number one is Berlin. We grow at a pace of approximately 25,000 new Viennese per year. And, um, well, I always say, 25,000 new Viennese are 25,000 new opportunities, right? But it's also a challenge, because we need to actually build, produce a small town, a small Austrian town within our borders each and every year. It's important to keep in mind, I think, that urban growth is a challenge and an opportunity. We don't need to fear it, and that is part of the Viennese DNA, not fearing growth but managing it and facing the challenge. Um, and possibly we have done this the right way, using urban growth as an opportunity. Because you've heard it already, um, Vienna is ranked regularly as the world's most livable city, according to MRSA 14 times in a row, and fourth time in Economist, this year also Forbes and Monocle and whatnot. Now you may be, hopefully, very critical of counting livability with points. I am. But at least we must be getting something right. So what could it be? Well, let's start with history. Before we go into anything else, I think we should be looking into Vienna's 100 years tradition of social housing. And when I speak of social housing, I speak of high quality housing. I mean, look at this. This is an historical example of the so-called period of Red Vienna. These used to be pieces of city in themselves. They had libraries. They had schools and kindergartens. They had, actually, what you see, the basin there, originally, it was for children to play with water. They had vast green inner yards. So it was actually all about education also, and communication, and community life and not just having a roof that one could afford on top of one's head. Now, today, of course, all of this has been transformed into something different, but the principles remain the same. That means that Vienna, actually right now, has a housing stock, a social housing stock, that accommodates 62% of the Viennese. Um, that is, of course, these are impressive numbers. You can see that the city is spending more than 500 million per year. And it collaborates with approximately 50 non-profit housing developers. And the city has a highly active land policy. Um, so just perhaps to, to, to give an impression of how active this is, um, there is a zoning category, a land use category in, in Vienna that was introduced in 2019 and that says that as soon as a development exceeds 150 units, two-thirds mandatorily need to be subsidized housing. So this is, of course, extremely radical. I don't think that you will find it anywhere else in the world right now. But looking into Rotterdam, why not 20%, 25%, 30%? Take any percentage that you think that would work, but take one. 
Now, these 100 years of social housing history and tradition, of course, mean that the city today has a highly even socioeconomic distribution. So you will find no areas where exclusively the rich live without social housing in between, and you will find no areas where only people with a weak socioeconomic background live without actually even luxury developments in between. And by the way, what is also special about Vienna is that due to this, and because historically social housing used to be non-accessible for migrants when they arrived in Vienna for several years until they had the Austrian citizenship, migrants, well, the welcoming parts of the city for migrants were the historical parts, which is the central parts of the city which means that we have no situation like in other parts of Europe where you have the well-off at the center of the city and then the migrants living somewhere in the suburbs and having to ride one hour or one and a half hours with the train so that they can access um, resources, right? So this is actually a strength. Now, this said, my impression from Rotterdam, I've been only here a day, so I have to apologize. I can only share with you my very first impressions. But my impression of Rotterdam is that of a fragmented city, where you have areas where you have the socioeconomically weak, and then you have other areas where you have the well-off in their developments, and then you have more or less, well, a barrier in between. It can be a physical barrier in the worst of cases, like example given a highway, that is typical, you can find it in many cities. It can be the river, it can be something else. Sure enough, if I think of Rotterdam, and if I will be thinking of Rotterdam in the future, I will be thinking a lot about connections and about the glue. What is the glue that brings us together in a city? And this is a lot what I will be speaking about tonight or this afternoon. So the city aims at 7,000 additional subsidized units per year at a very high quality. And, and here's something very special about Vienna. Social housing in Vienna is not about vulnerable groups. It's about middle class. It has no stigma. It's affordable housing for everybody. So 75% of the Viennese qualify for social housing in terms of income limits. You can see the current income limits. And mind you, these are net income limits. So, only the very rich do not qualify for social housing. And there's a three-pillar model that actually forms the business case. I, I'm simplifying, of course, a lot. But basically, pillar number one, the land needs to be affordable. Now, this is something I would like to share with Rotterdam. If cities can do anything in most cases, then the minimum that they can do is to have an active land policy. So either the city provides the land or it strategically builds up resources of affordable land or it introduces, example given, as said before, a land use category that will actually correspond to regulating land prices via percentages of mandatory social housing within new developments. Whatever approach a city takes, in most cases, cities have this lever in their hands, and Vienna is using it. So pillar number one is the land needs to be affordable. Pillar number two is non-profit housing corporations are provided with long-term, low-interest loans. So subsidies are loans that need to be returned. So this way, the city actually manages a revolving fund where money keeps returning. It puts also additional money from its own budget. And as said before, this is given off as a subsidy to non-profit housing corporations. And pillar number three, the rent is real cost rent. It is what results out of the investment for this development. No profit, but real cost. And if a vulnerable person with a vulnerable background still can't afford, they can then receive an individual grant. 
But this way, we have high quality, affordable housing for middle class, and we're able to do it in high numbers. Speaking about numbers, in terms of investment, you can here see that the annual budget is beyond, well beyond 500 million. This is the budget 2017. Um, and there are housing competitions, social housing competitions. That means that non-profit corporations need to compete against each other for subsidy and a piece of land. And you can see that the criteria are it needs to be socially inclusive, it needs to be, of course, a stable business case, it needs to be um, of high quality in architecture, and it needs to be ecologically innovative. And this was the last criterion, by the way, that has produced such a degree of innovation, you wouldn't believe that. Now, this is just an example that I love because they lost the competition. So I, I always ask myself, I keep asking myself years now, if they lost the, the competition of this quality, who won it, right? But it just gives you an example of the kind of quality we're talking about. Now we move on in this introductory part. Vienna is a green and blue city, pretty much like Rotterdam, and pretty much like Rotterdam, there is a strategy here to develop green spaces to do additional greening and strategic tree planting to take care of what we already have. Now, this is an example, historical, again, from the 70s and early 80s, of how the city always uses every new project as a connection. What you here see is the Danube Island. It was actually a measure, a project, for flood protection. Um, and it has worked. So Vienna has not been flooded ever since, really seriously. What is the most important part about it is that there was a decision that this is not is going to be given to, for development, to have some revenue. It will be paid for entirely by the public hand. It will be a park at a length of 24 kilometers with sandy beaches. And look at all of these connections. There are two metro lines bringing you directly there, plus several pedestrian bridges, cycling bridges, etc. Now, this is a place that has actually connected two parts of Vienna that were disconnected before, the eastern part and the western part. And where we meet, where we all meet, regardless where we come from in Vienna, is on that island in the summer. By the way, there's a huge festival there that lasts one week. I'm saying this because think of Rotterdam and think of the river. Is it a connection or is it a divide? I will leave it up to you to think about it, but I think it's always about using whatever you have and whatever project you go out to create connections. Now, we move on, no, we move back. That's the last one. Speaking of connections, Vienna is a city of public transport. It has one of the densest public transport networks that you can find worldwide in a city this size. So it has a metro, it has several tram lines, buses. You never have to walk for longer than three minutes to reach the next stop, at least in the western parts of the city, and you almost never have to wait for longer than three to five minutes in rush hour. This, again, is something that I would like to share. Because, of course, it cannot grow overnight. It takes years and years and years and decades to grow. But a public transport network, as we all know, is the precondition for just about everything that you will be seeing from now on. So managing transitions, 10 lessons to share. Let's see if I can make it. Well, I'll start with how do we plan the livable city? I mean, that was more or less, well, not exactly when I started, I'm not that old, but really, a couple of years before I started in Vienna, back in 96, as a young city councillor, it was more or less like this. So, it had a lot to do with plans and mapping. By the way, this is something that we have lost as a competence, meanwhile, because what we do now, nowadays is we go for strategies, which are 
much better than plants if they don't stand alone without plants. But that's another story. We can't go into this this afternoon. Now, Vienna has strategies for just about anything, I suppose, Rotterdam, too. I love these strategies. I was vice mayor. Most people don't know what's in there, right? And they don't care. It's something, it's a coffee table thing. You put it there somewhere on your desk. And if you really know what's in there, you're one of the few who have worked at it, really, right? But it's important. It's important. And I'd like to draw your attention to one of them. I hope it's on that slide. Yes, it's the master plan participation which, by the way, amongst other things, has produced a framework and standards for citizen involvement. So all of these plans, actually, together, combined, is what we need in order to be able to know how we're moving, not only where we're moving to, but also how we plan to do this. And then, yes. Let's also bring just one example. So this is an example of, of the numerous strategies that Vienna has. That is the core sentence of Vienna Smart City Strategy, where we say we want to be a city that is actually, that provides the highest life quality for everybody, and not just for the few and exclusive who can afford everything, while consuming as little resources as possible through constant innovation. What does it really mean in real life? Well, let's start by defining life quality. Now, I said before, I'm not in favor of counting livability with points. I'm in favor of understanding what could it be really. So, in our case, we spent some time discussing it very intensively, and the answer was, we want to be a city that's good for children. By the way, before I say that, let me also stick my finger into your wounds. This is the River Danube. You can swim there. <laughs> Something to invest, perhaps. Water quality, right? Um, now, we said we want to be a city that's good for children. And you may ask, why? And the answer is because what we wish for our children, what we long for for our children, is what we love for ourselves as well. So we want our children to grow up in a healthy and safe environment. We want them to be able to move around freely and play. We want them to have access to nature. We want them to be able to play with water, right? And all of these things we love for ourselves as well. Now, if the city cannot provide these things at the heart, at the very heart of the city, this is what happens. Young couples, when they know that the first child is arriving, think, oh, now we have to move to the suburbs and buy a little house somewhere in the countryside so that the children can have a happy childhood. And then that means, of course, that cities are growing like endless carpets of little houses. Los Angelization is an expression for that. I grew up in such a city that is Athens, by the way. And this is where they spend the rest of their lives then. This is where I grew up, actually. Today, I heard that people in Rotterdam love sitting in the cars just for the purpose of sitting in the cars <laughs> during the pandemic, so I was told. Well, I can tell you this is how I grew up in Athens. And it stole two to three hours of my life every day trying to go to school. It steals people's lives. I will explain in a second why. So trying to bring the kids to school, trying to go to work, trying to do anything they need for everyday life. Three hours per day in congestion, make it two. If, if you make the exercise, how much is it through a year, you will find out that it is second holiday that you spend in congestion in a car. So it's about time also, very valuable uh, today. If I gave you a second holiday, I mean, really, I have to stop with this joke, but not even the Dutch would spend it in a car, right? And I'm really, I'm, really, I'm really trying to say it is not only about time, it is also about what it does with our cities then. So, we want to be a city that's good 
for children, because a city that's good for children is good for us all. That was the idea. And that is what it may look like inside the city, and that is what it may look like in a new urban quarter. That is the new urban quarter of Lakeside, Aspen. So the threefold strategy in Vienna is affordability, livability, as I just explained it, and number three, community. And it is the combination of the three, if you ask me, that has taken Vienna where it is today. So, if lesson number one was being a city that's good for children, I would say lesson number two is using new urban quarters as an opportunity. But an opportunity for what? Well, I would say using them as an opportunity for transformation and repair, and using them as a connection. Using them as a piece of glue, gluing other parts of the city together, bringing people together. So Vienna is in the privileged position of disposing of several former um, brownfield areas, railway areas, military areas, hospital areas, etc., that are quite in the center of the city and are now open for redevelopment. So you can see, actually, some of them here. And here's the one that I would like to take you to. It is the new Northern Railway Station, urban quarter. This is where a railway station used to be. And where the yellow arrow points is already built. And the images that you will be seeing are from there. So the philosophy in Vienna of planning new urban quarters is always to create a vast, open, 24-7 accessible green space in the middle and to have high density at the edges. Why? Well, not only in terms of, of course, climate resilience, sponge city, green and blue city, you name it, also because we have found out that these green, vast, accessible green areas are exactly the glue that I've been talking about, bringing people together, benefiting everybody in the nearby areas, and providing a space where community life can evolve. We go for a broad social mix. As I mentioned before, it can go up to two-thirds of social housing, um, and a mix of uses, by the way. So it's not only housing, it's always housing and working spaces. We introduce smaller parcels of land to enable collaborative housing groups to be also present in every new urban quarter. Um, collaborative housing groups are social housing projects that have been designed by the tenants themselves. And what we have found out is that because these people spend highly active, as you can imagine, two to three years working together as a group to design the building, once they arrive, they are already a community and they function as community magnets that will then organize all other people in the new area around them. We put a focus on cycling and walking on the surface. We always introduce high-level public transport access. But the most important part to share here is that we always introduce collective garages, so collective parking at the edges, so that people can walk the last mile. If you can always, of course, drive to your front door uh, very slowly, so the traffic organization in this case is shared space, which we have actually copied from the Netherlands. Um, but, um, as said, you drive very slowly, you do whatever you have to do, and then you need to drive back to the collective garages and leave the car there. By the way, these are always um, overground, not underground, and that saves us money. We use this money to give it back to tenants as amenities for the community. So, what you see here is a rooftop swimming pool on a social housing project, which is in Vienna actually not an exception. It is something very common, and it's just an example of what can be done 
on a social housing budget um, if, example given, you don't spend so much money putting cars underground. Uh, and I mentioned before the, the collaborative housing groups. This is an example of a collaborative housing project. What is also very important, we introduced mandatory ceiling heights a couple of years before to make sure that we have shops um, and social uses in ground floors. So we don't end up having, you know, this kind of pajama cities with no life at all, uh, where people go only to sleep at night, right? So lively ground floors, lively streets. And again, again, it's about connections. It's about the glue. It's about what brings us together. It's about what makes public space lively, because this is where the city is. And this is where we have to actually put all our efforts to help people come together. We introduce space for community action. So here is an example of, of community farming in a new urban quarter. And we always introduce a school campus, a multi-generation school campus. Here again, we can see it's about mixing and connecting children of different ages in one building that opens up on the green space so that children can always walk to school safely and back without parents having to take them there by car. Also, you can imagine that these schools and the green bus spaces in front are again community magnets. I'll flip over that. And of course, all of this can be only done with citizen involvement. So in this case, we embarked in mobile citizen involvement. We go where people are. So there's a tent that is an exhibition. The Lego table that you can see in the backdrop is used by the, not by children, but uh, f f by adults, so that you can experiment with mass and space um, to see you know, what different types of decisions would actually mean. Um, and it is put in squares in front of schools, in front of metro, st metro stations where people are. By the way, this is the way we used to do it some years before. And the way it's been still done in so many places in the world. And then everybody wonders why it doesn't work, right? I mean, who'd you miss there, really? Let's say women in the first place, young people in the second. And it's a typical example of these frontal situations where you have, in the evening, old people because nobody else would come in the evening. And by the way, they're angry. So it always brings terrible results, by the way. And here's another example. That's a much better one. It's in public space in front of a metro station. By the way, the, the, the results for men and women have been separately documented. That was already, you know, progress. But who's missing here still? Right. And that is the one example of an involvement project that I love because we went into schools and involved the children as well and took them out to public space and let them experience and experiment with public space and let us know what it is that they need. The results can be visited in Vienna. It's a wonderful place that has been redesigned. So, it's about empowering local communities to be part of this. And there are numerous examples of site activation events. This is just an example of a summer cinema, but in the end, it's a community activation event, bringing people together, who then worked all together. We had more than 2,000 people participating here, and more than 100 ideas that came in in an open ideas competition for the new urban quarter. People wanted that the wild green space that was there already behind, you know, high walls when it was still railway area is preserved the way it was. It's trimmed a tiny bit, but it's an urban wildness. So that was the result. And they went for high-rise buildings, you wouldn't believe it, in order to preserve as much of the green space as they could. And please do not believe that we don't have NIMBYs in Vienna and do not believe 
that the Viennese are other than other people. In Vienna, everything that is beyond two to three stories is considered to be a monster building. So you can see that by using the right tools and having a framework and having tools and governance in place to do that, you can reach other results. And that is something that I love sharing because in many cases, we all go in our cities for this kind of, 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 of experiments, but it may be that they fail just because we're doing some mistakes. Now, moving on, I'd like to share one last example from a new urban quarter and um, then move on to the already built city. So that was Lakeside Aspirin with the lake. It's a big new urban quarter for 40,000 people to live and work there all together. It is still being developed in different phases. You can actually, you could actually see here um, that in different phases of development, we got some things wrong in the beginning and then we got some things right later. But the lesson I would like to share is that also here again, it's about realizing in your urban quarters that the street is the connection. It's the river of life in the city. It's the glue. And that once you go for a new urban quarter, for a new area, I'm not talking about small developments, right? I'm talking about pieces of city. There is no need to reproduce the grid there. Just get out of the cage and do streets differently. Design them from the beginning as places for life. And this is what we did here. And another best practice from there that can be shared is what we all know from urban quarters is that in the beginning, it takes a long period so that shops will be operated. And that means that in the beginning, everybody is car dependent, more or less, in order to do everyday shopping. So we wanted to have a shopping street there that will be fully operated from day one, and we work together with the shopping center. And we actually asked them to help us design the ground floors because social housing developers are into social housing. How do they know how to, do, to develop shops in the right sizes, right? And where to put which size? And how many we need for each size? So they helped us design this and they started operating it as an open shopping center, which means that from day one, we had the mix that we needed when the first tenants arrived. Now, that takes me to number three. And number three is using new urban quarters as an opportunity to create networks. I am, to be honest, deeply convinced that impact is the result of networks. That you can do so many things that are wonderful, but if they're not connected, there will be either no impact or at least less impact than, if, that, than you could have, you could achieve if they were connected. And to, to help understand why I, th I feel this is because, Maria, yes? I'm going to interrupt because your microphone, there's something wrong with it and it's getting annoying, more annoying by the, by the minute. So I okay. To, is it okay if I give you this one? I yes, know this we'll, is annoying. Have, to, we'll this, have to turn it off. They will, they will do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Then I can put this thing away for a moment. Yes. So, um, using urban court, as I said, as an opportunity to create new connections and networks. So think of a, of a cycling network that were not a network, like you had a cycling lane in every street, but it was not connected. Right? So that is what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make. It's about connections and networks. Um, and in this case, we said we want to use new urban quarters as a, an opportunity to create a network of green and open spaces. Um, that means we connect already existing green spaces with additional green spaces in new urban quarters via green boulevards. And we want to be a city of connected places. That means a strategy for polycentric development aiming at creating a center in every neighborhood. So the idea that every neighborhood, 
neighbor neighborhood needs to have a center where people can meet and come together, where community life can evolve, where its heart is beating. And that these may, must be connected via cycling connections, of course, walking connections, public transport, um, in order to reach the five-minute city. So what does it look like, really? Transforming historical neighborhoods means, first and foremost, having tools there in place to help us steer that. Vienna went for the so-called urban renewal teams. These are teams of young architects, planners, um, urban geographers, social workers that come together, form a non-profit company, win a tender that is repeated every five years, receive a budget from the city that will cover their costs, basically, and a small budget for interventions. And then what they do is to steer every development within the area, their area. Historically, they were formed to steer the renovation of the historical parts of the city in Vienna. You can see here what they looked like in the mid-70s, what they look like today. They did this within a period of approximately 30 years. But, of course, and here you can see nowadays there are five, so these are the areas where they're working in Vienna. And that's the way they work today. Nowadays, having done this, they actually work in neighborhood development and public space. So, when the city has an idea, we will take it to them and they will put it to discussion. When local community has an idea, they will take it to them and they will put it to discussion. When an individual has an idea, the same. They're a catalyst. They are mediators. They are translators, let's put it this way, between the municipality and administration on the one hand, and politics possibly, and local communities on the other hand. And what they do, what they have been doing for more than 30 years now, is building trust. They're trusted. They're, the magic is that they're trusted by the people and they're trusted by administration. They will help develop simple plans and if it's something more complicated, they will support that it reaches a, stadium of, a stage of maturity that it can then be uh, supported financially by the city and we can take you know, the normal processes that we take until it can be implemented. So, this is what it is about. It's about making room for public space. Oh, I've got to speed up. Public transport, I mentioned this before, is the city's backbone and it's all about space. Now, not having so much time left, I will move on quickly because I'm in the Netherlands and I don't need to tell you anything about cycling. <laughs> and I will take us all the way to walking. Now, we said we want to be a city made for walking. And I deeply believe that walking is a powerful indicator of whether you are in the right direction, moving in the right direction or not. Now, in order to do that, we have a plan to create long pedestrian boulevards that will take you all the way through the city. So long walks, imagine, in every direction with optimal conditions for walking. And we started with the basics, so speed limit, 30 kilometers per hour, within all neighborhoods, all residential areas. But it's about rethinking the street, of course, as well. Rethinking the street at a scale of the entire city means going, of course, for the so-called 1,000 needle strategy. What do I mean by this? You need a plan, example given, I mentioned before the long walks, the long pedestrian walks throughout the city, and then you use every opportunity that comes along. You can do stretch by stretch, you can do it on behalf of the municipality, you can do it with engagement from local communities, you can do big stretches, pedestrianization projects, example given, you can do small things as well. But the idea is that as soon as you have a network, 
and a plan, then again, even the smallest intervention has an impact and falls into place. That is the 1,000 needles strategy in Vienna. So I mentioned the network of green and open spaces that we keep expanding, aiming at being able to enter it within like 300 meters from any spot in the city. And here's just an example. So that's a pedestrianization project that was a big emblematic project back in 2000. That is what it looked like in 2013. It's our longest shopping street. That is what it looks like since 2015. And of course, we had citizen involvement there um, on site. And of course, it was highly controversial, as you can imagine. But this is where my hair grew gray. <laughs> but we, we were able, we had a referendum that was won by a small margin. We were able to build it. And I would just like to show you a couple of things of what it means and what it unleashed, right? So we introduced water tables there for children to be able to play with water. You remember that I always keep saying how important water is in bringing us together, by the way, in public space. And now it starts expanding in all adjoining streets. So here's an example of what it means at a very small scale, but literally everywhere in the area. This is the same street the way it looked like two years ago, the way it looked like last year. Okay? And then we have people that come and ask us it was highly controversial before. When you wanted to do something, they would ask you, how many parking spaces will it cost? Not how much money, how many parking spaces, right? And they would be against it. Meanwhile, we have people coming from the neighborhoods and asking us to do this. So here's an example. Organized, the dialogue organized by local community, the money came from the city. Shared space. Here's another example. The dialogue and half of the money came from local real estate in the center of the city. The other half came from the city, from the municipality. This is what it looked like before. This is what it looks like today. Meanwhile, we have created a scheme around it, and we have more than seven to eight projects that have been realized this way. We keep having one additional of these projects approximately per year. And now I will flip you very quickly through some very simple interventions. So it can be as simple as that in front of a school. It can be more elaborate. This is Vienna's first superblock, not by coincidence, in front of a school. There's a heat island map and a strategy to mitigate local urban heat at the local level. And here are just some examples of the interventions that go with it. These are very small things. The magic is that they're everywhere and they're connected. Here's an example again. And another one that used to be the ugliest, one of the ugliest places in Vienna that you can imagine. And it's actually a roundabout. You have cars driving around it. And with this simple intervention, it's a place for life where people can come together. And here's another example. And another one. That is a terrace hanging on top of the metro in a very dense place with almost no open spaces. And making the most of opportunities. Sometimes you just need to be shrewd. In this case, it was a bridge that we shut down for innovation. And then we never reopened it for car traffic. Nobody missed it. We didn't, we, we, weren't, we were unsure before if we should, you know, dare do that or not, or if I will be running around with my head under my arm, you know, again. But it worked. Embrace temporary action. And here we come at the heart of communities. So, summer child play streets organized by local communities. Cool streets are simple as that throughout the summer when it gets too hot. It's there in the morning and it's gone in the evening with a very small 
support, financial support, if any needed, on behalf of the city. In most cases, it's just about enabling it in terms of allowing for it and less about financial support in these cases. Here is a permanent cool street that emerged out of this scheme. Here's a shared space where communities started organizing this market on a temporary basis, and then we used the next maintenance as an opportunity to create a shared space that is there for everybody and is still used, of course, once, once a week as a market. And, last but not least, support community-driven innovation actively now. It all started with rediscovering the water at the heart of the city, that is the Danube Canal. So all that you see here was not there 20 years ago. It was the first pioneers that went down there and opened up small canteens that actually unleashed this development that was supported by the city. But let me take you here. This was the very first neighborhood oasis, which actually was created by somebody who was living in this very gray, dense street in a neighborhood with no open and green spaces at all. And what we did back then was to just allow for it to happen. Big discussion in administration back then. And that inspired us because it was such a success to create a grant for, um, for local communities where everybody, literally anybody who has an idea to develop something in their own street, in an underused space, example given, can receive a small grant. It's 4,000 euro. The only precondition is that it has to be open to use without paying entrance or without having to consume something. And um, there is a prototype contract for using public space. So, look at these things that people do. And again, I'm saying it's all about connections. It's all about connections. Physical connections, social connections. Of course, also economic connections, but it's about providing a framework for it, governance tools for it, physical space for it, and sometimes just allowing it to happen. Public plural partnerships, hence, is the last lesson to share here. It is about working together with local communities to produce transformation at the local level, systematically, and realizing that transformation is not a public-private partnership alone, it can be a public-plural partnership. This is an example of what it can be in public space. That was an, a farm for a summer, by the way. Um, but it can also be citizen solar power plants. In this case, the operator is the electricity company of the city of Vienna, but the solar power plants belong to the people of Vienna. Anybody can be part of this with as little as 50 euro and as much as 10,000 euro, and we've had more than 30 of them emerging in the last years. So, the insights and takeaways, I will be happy to share this. I will just make one point per slide, and then you're saved. I stop talking. So, the first one, the first point that I would like to make for this slide is that it is actually about trust. And trust needs to grow. And that means, if we wish for a collaboration systematically between the city on the one hand and local communities on the other hand, and I'm sure that this is the way to transform the city, because vision, vision is something that is, in many cases, even personal. But transformation comes from the entire ecosystem. And leadership, by the way, is not a top-down thing, as many people think. Leadership is whenever each and every one of us decides to do and change something. At this moment, we take up leadership. So we're not just city makers, we're all city leaders. But we need an ecosystem in order to produce something. 
And in order to create a productive ecosystem, you need trust. And as trust grows, you need a framework and governance tools. You need teams that will be there and facilitate this process. So if there's one thing to share with Rotterdam in what I have seen from what I have seen yesterday, then this is the first connection that you need. You need the missing link between administration and possibly local communities in order to make it work. Second, it's about long-term plans and it's about what I mentioned about, I think, 10 times this afternoon. It's about thinking connected, creating networks, realizing that impact comes from networks and going for connections. Connections, connections, physical connections, social connections, but connections. Number three, that's it, get started. You can start anywhere, anywhere. You can't get it wrong. And you can start big and you can start small, but get started. Here's the Viennese way. I would say the Viennese way, if we would read all of this, it would be density, centrality, it would be affordability, livability, ownership of critical infrastructures, flexibility, diversity, networks, connections, co-creation, urban transformation, care and repair. Again, the message here is collaboration. And in a nutshell, this is, I think, what it takes and this is what Vienna can share. On the one hand, the fundamentals that we have everywhere. This is the vision and the plans. The operations, this is where most cities have weaknesses in terms of missing governance structures and tools and where we can learn so much from each other. And momentum, which will maybe grants, maybe, by the way, Olympic Games, just to name an example of a momentum and what it meant for transforming parts of Paris at least. But it is even more so supporting local communities because they can create a momentum, a huge one, by the way. So three keys for Rotterdam, the three C's, right? Connections, collaboration, capacity. Capacity, by the way, can also be a product of connections. And this said, think networks, think inclusion, think diversity, think out of the box. And we end with sticking my finger in your wounds again. Thank you. <laughs>